give me a new piece of chalk and I can solve any problem. Okay, I love it. X hat is equal to arg min over x of f of x plus, ah, I'm going to make it a little more complicated, beta times h of x. So if beta goes up, you have more regularization. And down, you have less regularization, right? Everybody's got that? Because we need to be able to control the amount of regularization. Because the regularization trades off as a, our way of controlling the trade off between bias and variance, right? So if we have a lot of regularization, we have a lot of bias, but we have less variance. If we have very little regularization, we have uh, less bias, but more variation, or variance, right? More variance, okay? So now, that's the problem. And the solution is we have a repeat. This is gonna be like the ADMM algorithm. And we have, I always have to make sure I get this right, X and V, okay? X goes to F, of v minus u, and u goes start initializes at zero, and say v initializes at whatever some initialization, some guess that you think is pretty reasonable for your problem. Yeah. So for this beta, are you just saying that you're not calculating the math estimate anymore? I'm sorry. Say that last thing. Are you just departing away from that math estimate interpretation? Well. Uh, interesting, good question. Uh, so then we're saying that the probability distribution is equal to 1 over z exponential of minus beta times h of x. And this is a parameter that controls the distribution. If beta is larger, then the distribution is peaked more around the maximum of h. And, and if beta is smaller, if beta is zero, then it's uniformly distributed over the set, the space, okay? In that case, it's, but beta is a positive number. And um, later we'll see that beta here can, is the interpretation of being uh, uh, analogous to one over temperature, where temperature is thermodynamic temperature, like temperature, like the thing that you measure the temperature outside in the morning, okay? So, uh, all right, is that an answer? Okay, and, and, and the reason we put this here is because, you know, sometimes you can pick a function like this, but you're not sure how to pick beta, okay? And we'll see, okay? that you, inevitably, in real problems, you need to be able to control the level of regularization because you're not sure. I mean, it's application specific. Sometimes you want a really smooth image. You just want, you know, it's almost like sometimes you want a very simple answer and sometimes you want more detail. So it, it tends to be application specific. So then uh, V, goes to h of x plus u, and u goes to u plus x minus v, right? And uh, f of, of v is equal to the arg min over x of f of x, okay, plus uh, one, uh, say 1 over 2 sigma squared uh, x minus v squared, right? And h, okay, um, h of v, uh, or h of, we don't make it h of, yeah, I'll make it h of v, equals arg min over x of, 1 over, the, this is 2 sigma squared. I'm going to mess with this later. So uh, this is uh, v minus x 
squared plus beta h of x, right? And that's the proximal map. But what I can do is uh, I, can, I can divide by beta, right? So this becomes beta. Ah, beta sigma squared, okay? And, um, and I'll divide sigma noise squared to be equal to beta sigma squared. Remember, we can pick sigma squared any way we want, okay? Because in the ADM algorithm, you can pick any sigma squared, and it should give you the right answer. It'll just control the speed of convergence. So, so this thing, so or with P and P, we have, oh, I'll write this over here so that it's cleaner. With P and P, we have, um, H of V sigma n squared uh, is denoiser uh, for additive white Gaussian noise of variance sigma n squared. So this could be trained or it could be designed, but the point of the matter is that uh, you take uh, you take v. This is a typical image. Okay. You add uh, w, where w is zero mean. sigma n squared i white noise, and this thing here is h of v sigma n squared, and this thing is v hat, your estimate, right? So this is a denoiser, okay? You can train the denoiser, you can design the denoiser, whatever you want, but it's a denoiser that's designed to remove noise Gaussian noise, okay, with variance sigma n squared, okay? So what I can do is I'll just replace this with this, okay? And I'm going to delete this. <coughs> And here what we do is we say uh, sigma n equals beta times sigma squared. So another way of putting that is that beta equals sigma n squared over sigma squared. Okay, maybe this is... Let's, let's summarize again. So, sort of summary. F V of sigma squared is just this. V of sigma n squared is this denoiser for additive white Gaussian noise of variance sigma n squared. Okay? 
So I can erase, I guess, all this other stuff. So this should maybe be right next to this, OK? So does everybody understand that? So the, the only th this is just what I said last time. The only thing that's different is that you can control the amount of regularization by controlling the amount of denoising, or the amount of noise that the denoiser is designed for. So whenever you have a denoiser, there's always a parameter in there you can control to, that controls the amount of assumed noise. Okay? Another way of thinking about it, as you increase sigma n, it does more aggressive denoising. So if you do very aggressive denoising, if sigma n is large, you do very aggressive denoising, and this is going to give a smooth result. If sigma n small, you do just kind of gentle denoising, it's going to give a, a less smooth result, OK? So, and so this is kind of handy because uh, the denoiser here, denoisers are often, like, they can be adjusted. The denoising process tends to be kind of unitless. So it's easier to control. This eliminates this problem of having to pick a regularization factor to some degree, OK? Because beta is unitless. Okay. Um, all right. So, is everybody okay with this? Do you understand that? Does that make sense? Okay. So now, what I'm going to do is erase these two boards here, and you understand that you can then train this, or you could just adopt one. Okay. And you understand this loop here, right? Okay. Now, problem slash question. Assume that uh, limit as, say, t goes to infinity uh, results in, uh, converges to, we'll call it x star equals v star, OK? OK? It converges. Well, I, I won't even say that. I'll just say x star. It converges, OK? Then, then what does this mean? Before, we were solving this optimization problem, OK? But now, it doesn't, it's not solving that optimization problem, OK? Because I just plugged in something else here. In fact, I should just erase this. Is it right if I erase this? Because it no longer means anything. We just replaced this H with a denoiser. OK, that was just an important conceptual flip. So let me go back and review that point very deliberately, OK? We had this function. We had the ADMM algorithm for solving it. But then, and then we had two proximal maps, one for f and one for h. But then we said, huh, I don't feel like using a proximal map here. I'm just going to put a denoiser in here. So we actually just took our favorite denoiser and put it in there, OK? Now, is our favorite denoiser a proximal map? Uh, probably not, but maybe. Probably not. Because, OK, what is your favorite denoiser? Does anybody have a favorite denoiser? Non-local means. Non means. Is non-local means a proximal map? So non-local means is an algorithm. Yeah. It goes around and it picks some different things. It's a very nice little algorithm. It's kind of slow, but it's very intuitive. And it does something interesting, and it works pretty well. Is it a proximal map? It 
well, let me ask you this. Is it obviously a proximal map? No. Could it be a proximal map? Maybe you could find some function. Maybe. Let me ask you this. Are all functions proximal maps? It doesn't seem like it. Okay? Okay, so you can find conditions. Okay, so, so what does this mean? A plus is H of V. I'll leave off the sigma squared, okay? A, a proximal map. So if someone gives you a function, how do you know if it's a proximal map? If you can write, find the small h corresponding to that. You'd have to try to find an h car that, would, that uh, would result in it, right? But that's like solving an inverse problem itself. That's hard. It turns out that uh, Morel, Mor what's his name? Okay, Moreau, I'm sorry, Moreau? Moreau. Is a, I think, a French mathematician from the 1960s answered this question. Uh, uh, right. Um, it has to be non-expansive and self-adjoint, okay? Uh, uh, and so the answer is H is a proximal map, roughly speaking, uh, if, and all, uh, if and only if, okay? If and only if two conditions hold. Okay. Uh, uh, okay, this is, uh, okay, there's a more general theorem, okay? But I don't want to give you the more general theorem because it gets too complicated. So I just want to give you the rough idea, okay? I'll put here a rough idea. You can look at the paper if you want a better. A, a rough, because uh, I'm going to assume H is C1, continuously differentiable, okay? Which it doesn't have to be, because we gave, uh, uh, does it have to be continuously differentiable? Uh, I have to think about it, sorry. I don't want to go on the fly here, because I'll end up saying something's wrong. So let me just say it's continuously differentiable, then it has to have two conditions. Um, okay, the most important condition is that the gradient of H, okay, transpose equals the gradient of H, okay? And two is that uh, H is non-expansive. Okay, so it has to be non-expansive, and uh, so if it's non-expansive, what that means is that the um, uh, the eigenvalues, uh, right? The singular value. Okay, well, first of all, its gradient has to be self-adjoint, so it's symmetric. So its eigenvalues are real and equal. To, you know, so the eigenvalues have to fall in the range zero to one. Okay. Uh, the magnitude of the eigenvalues has to fall in the range 0 to 1. So, but this is sort of, this makes sense, by the way. Why is it not expansive? Because a proximal map is kind of moving towards a goal. Okay, I'm going to give you a very fuzzy idea. Okay, this is officially hand-waving. Okay, I'm hand-waving. Okay, I'm, wave, I'm literally waving my hand. That the proximal map moves towards some goal, right? But it doesn't move all the way towards it, right? So intuitively, um, intuitively, 
it doesn't, <laughs> I don't know, it, it doesn't expand, okay? It's sort of contractive, okay? It's not strictly contractive. It's not a contraction mac, because it can, uh, an example of a, because if you have a, uh, uh, you can have a proximal map for the constant function. So the proximal map for the constant function, the output is equal to the input. So in that case, it's not contractive, but it's not expansive. I haven't even defined expansive and contractive, okay? So I'm just purely appealing to your intuition. It's not super important for what we're doing. What's really important is this, okay? This thing, how many people have ever taken an electromagnetics course? So when is an electric field, uh, what are the conditions for, uh, for something to be an electric field? Can anything be an electric field? No, because the electric field is the gradient of a potential field, right? So what's the condition? Does anybody remember for something to be an electric field? Excuse me? The integral over a closed path is zero. Yes, that's true, but there's a simpler condition when the function is differentiable. So if this integral is zero? That's true, but there's a simpler condition, if anybody remembers it. It, it involves the curl. It's the zero curl condition, right? The zero curl condition. And does anybody remember the curl being zero for, for conservative vector fields? Okay. Uh, the same thing comes up in fluid mechanics, right? I'm not a fluid mechanics person. So this is zero curl. Only in n dimensions. Okay. So it's got to be a conservative function, uh, conservative potential field, okay? So this is conservative uh, field, uh, conservative function. So the function H is conservative if it's gradient and self-adjoint. Okay, so and that kind of makes sense because, oh, I don't have the, uh, the proximal map because it's the result of minimizing something, okay? I don't know. You'd have to go through it, but eventually you can convince yourself it's very similar kind of condition. So there's simple conditions. The point is most functions gradients are not self-adjoint. I mean, that's a special case that's pretty unlikely to occur if you just have anything, okay? So, uh, so therefore, in general, usually not. So the answer to this is usually not. So usually, if you pick any kind of function, any denoiser, it's usually not going to be a, uh, it has a zero curl condition. It's not going to be a proximal map, okay? So it's not a proximal map. Oh, it may be non-expansive. A typical, uh, a typical denoising operation may be non-expansive. That may not be such an unreasonable condition. But this thing is not going to happen usually. Okay. So the point is this. So if this is not true, then what's, are you solving an optimization problem? You're not solving an optimization problem is the answer. So you're not solving an optimization problem. I'll put here no optimization. Now, what's happened is that you guys have been, well, I don't know. You know, uh, a friend of mine once had a theory that we all start off super curious and everything, and then we go to kindergarten, and they spend the next 12 years beating curiosity. and and insight out of us, okay? <laughs> okay. By the time you've gotten to here, you're, there's like, you know, your equivalent mass of, of protoplasm, and you're like trying to remember what it was to think uh, independently again. So it's hard, so in that light, I mean, I include myself, so I'm not trying to pick on you or something. But uh, in that light, uh, um, 
you probably, at this point, and especially because of this class, you may start thinking that all interesting problems involve optimization. Because there's a lot of interesting problems that involve optimization. But not all problems involve optimization, okay? Not all problems. Some problems are just problems that are stated, like you might have y equals ax. You're just solving a set of equations. It's not necessarily an optimization. I mean, you can sort of characterize it. It's like, it may not be, or you might, yeah. So um, I like to give the example that, you know, it's sort of, the optimization viewpoint is more the modern viewpoint, okay? When you're solving a PDE equation, uh, well, if you're solving like uh, a, uh, oh, I always get these mixed up. I should know this, okay. Elliptic and hyperbolic, I'm pretty sure, and uh, parabolic. So, okay, if you're solving like a uh, Laplace's equation, Laplace's equation is parabolic, I think, right? Or it's hyperbolic. Oh, I can't remember. I better be careful. Okay, if you're solving a PDE equation, like Laplace's equation, it turns out that that has an interpretation as energy minimization. And that's why it solves problems like minimizing the energy of a thin membrane. But if you're solving an equation like this, this is self-adjoint. But if you're solving an equation like this, wave equation, oh, let's see, I don't know, the, uh, V of all, uh, d phi of t times d squared d phi. Wave equation, right? Then, uh, then it's not self-adjoint. And uh, wave equations like Maxwell's equation, I better not write this down. I'm a little afraid that this equation is not the right equation. But it's not, wave equations are not self-adjoint, and they do not solve. They're not the gradients of an energy potential function. OK. All I'm trying to, I don't really want to go off too much in this because I'm afraid I'm going to lose you. The point is, you're not, not solving optimization You know, it's really hard to convince people of this because they're, they're like, yeah, but I don't understand what optimization problem I'm solving. And you say, I'm, you're not solving an optimization problem. Oh, you know, I get that. But what's the optimization problem you're solving? Okay, no, you're not solving an optimization problem. There's no optimization problem you're solving. Oh, well, then what problem are you solving? You're solving an optimization problem, right? No, you're not solving an optimization problem, okay? So what problem are you solving? So what problem are you solving? It, well, you could just say, well, I don't know. I'm not solving any problem. I'm just doing this thing because I like the answer, OK? But that's not very satisfying. So you'd kind of like to be able to say, what problem are you solving? Here's, well, here's the thing. If you let t go to infinity, right? And if this and it converges, and p and p converges, then what happens? Well, then what happens is that uh, u minus this, this update here has to stop changing, right? U has to stay the same. If U stays the same, that means that X minus V must go to zero, right? So if this thing ever converges, it must be that it can only converge if X minus V goes to zero, right? So you have to have that X star minus V star equals zero, okay? That means that X equals V. Well, if that's true, then you get that 
you get that x star equals f of x star minus u. I'll put a star here. And v star, I know, and, and x star equals h star of x star plus u star. Now, I get tired of writing the stars, so I'm just going to erase the stars, OK? Because it gets a little confusing, I feel, just too many stars floating around. Oh, there's definitely no star there. OK. I'm seeing stars. OK, all right? So this is the set of equations. And we call these the equilib consensus equilibrium equations. So really, this is what you're solving, OK? Now, intuitively, this thing is, is noise. Why? Because when I apply the denoiser to x plus u, the thing I get is x. So a denoiser removes noise, so presumably u must be noise. OK? Now, the intuition here is this. The intuition is this, that, that what happens is that you have uh, you have, this is your solution, x, OK? And then you have, this is x plus u, and this is x minus u, right? And this thing, that thing here is h applied to x minus u. h of x minus u takes this input and drives it to here, right? And f of x minus u takes that input and drives it to there, right? So this is a balance, set of balance equations that say that the, for, the action of h is the same as the action of f, right? So you want to find an x and a u such that the action of h and f are the same. So you want to solve these equations. You solve these equations. So that algorithm is no longer solving an optimization problem. It's solving this set of equations. But this, so the question is, does this set of equations have an answer? Okay. So, so now what I'm going to do is forget about all the stuff behind here. Now we're going to just take this as our starting point. <laughs> Actually, this is a more reasonable starting point. It doesn't require any constraint that there any optimization involved. This is our basic principle. We want to just solve this set of equations, OK? And the intuition I like to find, I like to think of f and h as people. So this is, these two people have different goals in life. And you're like, OK. You want to find a compromise between the two people. So you want to find an input. You want to find, but you're compromising on their output. So it's like you give one person, you say, it's like in a negotiation, right? You, you're like negotiating the price of something. You want to buy something. You start low and let them bring you up, <laughs> OK? I mean, you don't start. You don't start off by saying, I'll pay you $1,000 for that. Oh, no, I've changed my mind. I'll pay you 900 That would be, like, really confusing, OK? So you're, like, giving them inputs they don't like so much so that they move them to the same point as the output, <laughs> right? Does that kind of make sense? So now, here's the thing. Uh, all right. Um, so you want to solve these equations. Now, uh, let me see. Uh, we went over the proximal maps. OK, now, what we do is this. OK, so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to define f. Oh, god. 
Okay, I need a change in notation. Okay, unfortunately, I don't have a concept of bold face on the blackboard. I love blackboards, but they don't have bold face. So I'm going to have F. Okay, first of all, I'm going to have a thing I'm going to call W, okay? And W is going to be uh, W1 and W2. And W1 is X minus U, and W2 is X plus U, okay? Right? And then X, by the way, is W1 plus W2 over, over uh, 2, okay? So it's just a change of coordinates. I know this is going to look a little confusing. It's just a super little simple change, but it makes everything work out so much better. Okay? And then what happens is that you know you have a function. I'm going to define a function. Define g. So g is like bold face. I'll put a bar over it to designate that it's bold face on the blackboard. And this is w is equal to w bar over w bar, where w bar is equal to w1 plus w2 over 2. So g is a very simple operation. All it does is it, it's, I'm defining this function. It just, it takes, I call this the stacked input. You know, stacking things has become a little easier for people to believe or understand because of deep neural networks. And, uh, but, so you just stack two inputs, okay? And G, G is, just computes the average of the two inputs for each of the outputs. So the intuition here is G is an operation which takes, like each of you give me some input. I average them all and I redistribute them to everybody. Okay, it's, it's really pretty simple. I know it's probably confusing, but I'll go over it again. It's really not that complicated, okay? Now, all I'm gonna do is, you'll see, this is just some notation I'm gonna use to re-express the equations that are a little simpler, okay? And then I'm also gonna define f of w, okay? What's f of w? f of w is going to be f of w1 and h of w2. So this is all much to do about nothing, OK? All I'm it's just notation, OK? I have this new operator, which makes it easier to write down. Now, if I write, uh, if I write f of w, equals g of w, what does that mean? Okay, this thing here is the stacked operator. So it's f of w1 over f of w2. That's what this is, right? Equals what? G just computes the average of the two W's, right? So it takes W1 plus W2 over 2, and this is W1 plus W2 over 2, correct? Right? But this thing here, what's W1 plus W2 over 2? Uh, oh, shoot. Oh, yes. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Oh, no. Hold on. Uh, I screwed something up. No, no, I didn't screw anything up. Oh, thank goodness. This is x and x, right? Because that's what w1 plus w2 over 2 is. It's x. Remember, this is w1, and that's w2. So if I average w1 and w2, I get x, because the two u's cancel out, right? It's really simple. It's simple, but there's a lot of little simple manipulations here, so it's easy to lose your way, okay? So this is x, and this is just f, this thing here is, this is f 
of x minus u, and this is h of x plus u. My point is, this equation is exactly the same as that equation. They're the same equation. Uh, I'm sorry, say that again. Uh, yes. Up at the very top of that part, you define f being f of w1 and f of w2. Uh, you accidentally wrote f of w2 at the bottom. Oh, yes. Then that was a Freudian slip. Okay, because pretty soon I'm going to get rid of the H's and I'm just going to all use F's because it gets too complicated, okay? That was a Freudian chalk slip, okay? All right? Is it clear? Because what I'm about to do is going to be magical. Actually, I have one minute left and it's just so beautiful, okay? Are you ready for some real heavy duty magic? Actually, Halloween's coming. I love Halloween. Did I mention that? Yeah. And the big bars and stuff like that? Okay. Now, here's the thing. So, now can I get rid of the little bar things because it's a pain? And it's going to interfere with the magic. So, this is... Okay, that's, that's the equation we're solving, correct? And by the way, what does G do? It just takes the average of the two. The w is a stacked vector, and G takes the average of the two elements. F just applies each agent to each element, right? Right, you good? Now what you do is this, okay? This is just so cute, okay? I'm sorry, it's just... Okay, now you go, oh, 2f of w equals 2g of w, right? No problem there. By the way, you notice I just dropped the, the parentheses because I'm just using operator notation. But that's okay, right? You believe that. And then I can say, oh, 2f plus i of w, what does that mean? Uh, 2g uh, plus i of w, right? What does that mean? This means 2f of w plus w, okay? i just means, just means, you know, the identity operator, okay? So are, is everybody good with that? Okay, but now here's the really cool part. Okay, here's the really cool part. 2g plus i. Okay. I did do this right, right? Hold on just a second. Ha! Huh? No, okay, I knew I did something wrong. That's a minus. It doesn't matter, right? I just can do anything I want. This actually has a name. It's called the reflective resolvent. So if I, if I apply this, what I mean this is I mean I apply the two operators. I compose the, two, the operator with itself. I get 2g squared minus 4g plus i, right? This is algebra. And this is equal to, oh, but what's g? g computes the average of things, right? So what if I take 10 things, I average them, and I redistribute, and then I average them again? What do I get? The first step. Excuse me? The first step. Yeah, you get the first average, right? If I take the mean, if I take the average house price, I assign that price to every house, and then I average all the houses again, I get the average house price. So this is 2g minus, oh, wait, no, it's 4g. Gosh, you guys, I have terrible algebra skills. 4 minus 4g plus i. That's even for me, that comes out to i. Right? And it's just a property of the fact that g squared is g. Right? 
Now, uh, I'm almost finished. Oh shoot, I don't want to erase this. I have to erase this, I'll erase this, okay? I'm almost finished, because it's just so beautiful. This is so fun. This is so much fun. Okay, so therefore, if you have 2g minus i times 2g uh, minus i equals i, well, that means that this is the inverse. So that means 2g minus i inverse is equal to 2g minus i, correct? That's what it means to be an inverse. So I'm going to erase this. Can I erase this? So I get that 2g minus i times 2f minus i times w equals w. So if I so find this whole thing as t, ah, if I define that whole thing as t, this equation becomes t becomes this, okay? So the point is, to solve this equation, the, so result, uh, f w equals g w is exactly the same thing as t w equals w. This is, recall, this is called a fixed point of t. There's a fixed point algorithms are kind of a well-defined thing. That's how you solve differential equations, for example, by finding six fixed points. So the obvious way to find a fixed point is just keep iterating t. Because uh, what will happen, if you're lucky, what will happen is you keep operating, you keep applying t, eventually you'll uh, converge uh, to something, hopefully. Maybe not. When will you converge? One of the, co the sufficient conditions for convergence is that t is, is a, a contraction mapping, OK? But if it's non-expansive, I'm running out of time. Uh, I'll just, uh, there, OK, well, next time we'll talk about finding algorithms for finding the fixed point of t. But it turns out that the solution is that it results in exactly the same iteration as you have for ADMM. So this becomes a proof that the ADMM algorithm is convergent. <laughs> and the conditions for convergence are that t is non-expansive. But you can show that in the particular case where f is a proximal map, then t is non-expansive. Because this is non-expansive. This is actually, um, this is non-expansive. And, and for a proximal map, this is also not expansive because remember, that was one of the conditions for a proximal map. So this becomes a proof. This becomes a proof that actually I never gave you, right? I gave you a proof for the convergence of, um, it's in the notes. I gave you a proof for the convergence of augmented Lagrangian, but not ADMM. So this is a proof for, this is how you prove ADMM converges for the special case of a proximal map. But this all works when this, is an approximal map too, okay? So we'll talk about it next. So this becomes uh, sort of the interpretation of why this is effective, all right? Okay, and I'll then pick up on this. We'll do one more lecture probably on Monday and then uh, move on to the next topic. All right, thanks, bye.